Hi everyone, my name is Jordan Marshall. I'm the Chief Reporter at Building and the Chair of today's discussion, um, which is part of our Net Zero Live conference, which we're really excited about. Um, today's topic will explore how refurbishment is key to achieving net zero um, within all existing stocks, so both commercial and residential, um, and how, particularly as you know, existing stock is responsible for a huge proportion of carbon emissions. Um, it's particularly well timed today as the government has announced its new um, 10, uh, 10 step plan. Um, so we're really excited that our conference is timed well with that. Um, the first thing I'd like to do is welcome our speakers for today. Uh, Richard McWilliams, Director for Sustainability at Turner and Townsend. Kieran Walker, Technical Director at the Home Builders Federation. David Pierpoint, CEO at the Retrofit Academy. And Basil Demaratis, De Managing Partner. Yeah, Sorry, I just That's practiced That's okay. <laughs> Managing it's a tricky partner one. for partnership. Um, so the way today is going to work is each of our four speakers is going to give a um, bit of a presentation on the topic to introduce their key views and points on the subject um, before joining in for a group discussion and Q&A. Um, we'd love for as many of you to get involved in the Q&A as possible, so please feel free to send through your questions at any time and we'll strive to answer as many of them as we can. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over Richard, uh, who's presenting first. Thanks very much, and uh, it's a pleasure to be invited to um, present my views today, and I hope that it's um, prompt uh, active debate and Q&A later on. Um, what I aim to do to uh, get the ball rolling is to um, really present my views on what uh, one of the key retrofit and refurbishment challenges are, um, what the, is the essence of a solution, uh, a little bit of an example of how that is manifesting itself in real life, so it's not just theoretical, and then maybe finish off with a thought about uh, what you, uh, as everybody on this uh, call, including myself and the panel, can uh, do about that. So um, as a first uh, slide, really, to reflect on the challenge, if I can get that uh, working on the next screen. There we are. Now, this might all of a sudden start jumping around, I think, because we've had one or two technical glitches. You can see here, really, that with the, the challenge being that the real estate represents 44% of the built environment emissions, and we're not really doing enough about it, not least because 80% of the estate exists already that needs to be addressed, and that is hardly occupying any of the media or government attention at the minute. And to add insult to injury, I would say less than 1% of the actual new build uh, projects that are going on at the minute meet that requirement of the future to be net zero. So, and even where we are looking at these retrofit schemes, the solutions are too expensive, they technically can work, but actually technically often don't, and they don't deliver benefits uh, for the occupants, either as fuel poverty, or alleviation, warmth or comfort. And actually where those investments do happen, it's largely charitable investment by housing associations or, or, or it's government subsidy feeding a parasitic industry. And you know these are strong words I'm using here, but there is no compelling investable roadmap for net zero in our sector, regardless of how much money you spend with it. We haven't got the dynamic right. However, the flip side of this is there are major opportunities. In fact, the market is effectively so broken that actually it, present, it represents itself as a kind of paradigm shift. It's a real groundbreaking opportunity. And you know, evaluated at my valuation is more like 600 billion, but some people say it's at least three or 400 billion. The, the rate of retrofits needed in refurbishment of our domestic stock alone is 160,000 a year for 30 years. That's a market if ever seen one with 300,000 new jobs by some people's measure. There is a huge opportunity here, but two key facts to add to that. You know, COVID is tragic and I get that, but did you know, you know, every year 11,000 people in the UK die, in the UK die from living in an underheated home, from complications from living in an underheated home. That's just not acceptable. And actually, did you know that all our pension funds, the US stock market, 93% is mispriced due to climate risk. So there are huge compelling market factors that mean we have to address this, social factors and economic factors. And we've just got to get on with it. So for me, what I'd like to present to you as the solution is embracing a, an approach called energy spawn. And there's an example of the before and after here, houses neighboring each other, to implement the principles of a 21st century construction industry that's based on consumer focus, product performance, an actual investment model rather than a charitable cost model and creating a market dynamic which actually 
manifests itself as continuous improvement of the likes that's been seen in, in consumer goods in the in the vehicle market and everywhere else where the consumer really drives demand. So starting with that, we need a simple, desirable solution. But then we need one that works because the performance gap of existing retrofits and existing buildings even is 350% difference between what was planned and what was actually occurring, which means that nobody has the confidence to invest and make an investment case in these types of measures. And you can imagine if it just worked. If it was so desirable, it was like a phone upgrade that said, I tell you what, commit to your continuing utility bill and I will give you a home upgrade that makes it more like the house that's on the right, it's warm, comfortable and has zero additional cost to the house on the left that's drafty cold and actually causes health complications. And by doing that, you get investment into the loop and you drive the suppliers to continually adapt and improve their products. Now you might say, well, okay, that's all really good talk, but actually where is it happening? You know, we've got a pilot here in, in, in Nottingham, but how do we really get that to scale up? Well, I'm pleased to say that we've been working on that We're, through the Mayor of London's ERDF funded retrofit accelerator for homes, includes the title. Uh, and as part of that, what we've recognized is to really address the economies needed to drive down the cost and drive up the performance of these types of whole house industrialized solutions, you have to really aggregate demand. So we've done that working across London. We have some foundation partners in six London boroughs and I think there's another five that are coming on board. And what we've done is taken that demand to the supply chain and said, supply chain, if we can aggregate a huge demand pipeline for you, are you able to then invest with those housing providers in improving your products and processes to achieve that price and performance point? And actually both parties have said yes. And then we've gone to government and said, can you help us get this going? And they have said yes too. And that's resulted in the innovation partnership with a shared investment in R&D, with a, a support from our infrastructure and manufacturing consultants to drive down those uh, costs and improve performance. And then gradually, the procurement will release increased demand, a secure pipeline of work as performance improves to achieve ultimately a price point, which means at that point it will scale up. So really, uh, for more information, you look at the bit.ly link down there, bit.ly forward slash R-A-H-I-P, which is Accelerative Homes Innovation Partnership. And all I would say is to finish on my part is I would really say that, you know, this ha has to be about everybody because this is a movement. This is about the whole community of people that can act on this market to make it happen at scale and with pace. So as designers on this conversation, on, on this session, really, I'd be looking to you to actually think about what we all talk about. I, I'm an engineer by background, become a product designer, not a bespoke solution provider every time. For the contractors and the delivery organizations, again, be a solution provider. Actually hold stock of what you want to do and, and guarantee its performance uh, and guarantee outcomes from that. For property organizations, please spend wisely with the end in mind. Think 2050, not interim EPCC targets, which is a strategic misstep for this market in my view. And for government, well, in fairness, government's been doing a lot of work to support this market. I would just say, please keep up the good work. And just make sure that any subsidy that's coming through the Social Housing Decarbonisation Fund gets invested to promote this self-funding pathway to net zero for a retrofit market which spans from homes over to real estate. And ask you all to really play your part and help make it happen. So that's me opening. Apologies, I've no idea how long I took, but I ho hope that was uh, useful uh, as, as a baseline for other speakers. Back to you. Thank you so much, Richard. That was a great way um, to kick things off. I think next we're going to hear from Kieran. And, and as I understand it, Kieran, um, you're going to chat to us now. Um, so I'll let you kick things off. OK, thank you, Jordan. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I, I come to this event from a slightly different angle uh, from the Home Builders Federation. We, we represent 90% of the, of the UK house building market. And to be honest with you, the, the majority of our members are, are new build members. But I think with, with, with the subject matter, with, with this overarching target, I think there's a lot of parity that can, can, be, can be drawn between both you know, refurbishment and retrofit to, to the new build markets as well. You know, it'd be remiss of me not to, to mention the, the news that, 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 that's sort of come out overnight in terms of legislative change, uh, the future home standard, you know, the, the desire from government to obviously bring, bring mandatory standards on, on electric vehicles and, and, and outlaw effectively diesel and petrol cars but more importantly is is probably the the removal of, of gas uh, from, from all new dwellings from potentially 2023 now 
we saw at the at the outset of, of last year's um, March budget that um, a future home standard was due to be announced. We saw a consultation on that toward the end of last year, and there's been a consultation in in government that's been responded to later this year, or sorry, earlier this year. And um, within that, we saw two options on on energy efficiency and energy reduction. One being option one, twenty percent; option two being a thirty one percent reduction. Now, with with either of those options, and 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 you know, there are challenges. Um, in in the past, the the, the new build housing industry has has really tackled the the, the energy efficiency um, issues around with, with with fabric approaches and has uprated fabric has looked at innovation in fabric as well but actually to go to that next step now um in terms of our, our overall energy emissions from new dwellings it's going to involve new technologies and um, you know we're looking at heat pumps we're looking at smart technology we're looking at you know self-regulating technologies within the home as well add that to you know the, the implications of electric vehicle charging points that, that we saw on um, on Richard's flowchart a moment ago, the diagram a moment ago, we, we, we're seeing now, as of next year, a new, a new building regulation. Every new dwelling will require a 7.2 kilowatt charging point. Now, you know there are complexities in that, and, and you know not least electrical capacity. And um, you know the, the home two years from now potentially has an exponential uplift in electrical demand from what we're seeing at the moment from from you know air source heat pumps or heat pumps generally electric vehicle charging, smart charging in the home as well. So that there are challenges around that. Um, we're also seeing effectively, you know, challenges around supply chain. The the impacts on and the output of, of heat pump manufacturers, you know, how quickly are they able to upscale and deliver the productivity required in order to satisfy our requirements just in the new build sector of 300,000 new homes a year. Um, in addition to that as a skills piece and, and labor and skills, you know, who is going to fit the heat pumps who is going to fit the new technology and um, they are they are new technologies and you know i think really to echo what richard said in in, in his sort of last slide there you know we need everybody on board to actually stand a chance of, of, of meeting these targets not just in the new build sector but the wider construction sector as well um, we're seeing an overheating consultation coming through towards the end of this year which will pick up the the, the the non-residential or the non-domestic part of, of part LNF and that in itself will bring new challenges and will require an upskill of, of, of labour force as well but I think to focus on some work that um, the HVF are doing at the moment as well so we are we are putting together a future homes task force in fact the um, the future homes task force has been has been set up the the overarching objective there is to set out the roadmap that Richard referred to I think is in, in his second slide there where we set out a, a roadmap for delivery of the future home standard now we're doing that in conjunction with with house builders we're doing that in conjunction with consultants designers but we're also doing it in, in conjunction with regulatory bodies so we, we've got off what off gem we've got number 10 involved in those conversations the ea defra the whole the whole aspect of, of the wider construction industry and we're feeding into them and we, we, we're taking advice from them to form this, this 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 roadmap, what steps need to be taken for us to actually stand a chance to achieve net zero? Um, I, th I think that probably covers my my introduction, Jordan. If if that's okay, I don't know if that was too short or too long. No, no, that's perfect. Thank you so much. Um, I think it gives us a good um, perspective on you know, where, <coughs> where the conversation is going to head um, later, and also I think leads quite in quite well into um, what. Uh, David was going to speak about. So I um, will now make David present us so that he can share his slides with us. Um, and David, I'll hand over to you. Oh, David, you're just still on mute there. If you could unmute yourself, that would be great. I, I know, sorry, I, my fingers don't move as quickly as your brain, I'm afraid, but I'm, uh, I'm there now, I hope. Um, uh, yeah, that does set the scene very nicely. Um, in fact, uh, both both previous speakers have. Um, I, I'm going to focus on on the labour shortage than the supply chain challenge for delivering this mass scale market for retrofit over the next 30 years. I'm going to have to change this slide soon to 29 years uh, and shortly after that I'm afraid I think in 12 months time it's still going to say 27 million um, but it'll just say 29. Um, so we, we, we've got a hell of a job on our hands um, and we really need Sort of the building magazine audience really all the contractors and architects the, the sort of the the higher quality end and the large scale end of construction to, to come on board with this um for reasons i'll explain 
Um, just before I do, just to explain who we are, um, I run the Retrofit Academy. Um, we're a community interest company set up in 2016. Um, we are, the main focus of our work is, is in training what are called retrofit coordinators, uh, who are people who effectively project manage a retrofit project from one end to the other. Um, they oversee each of the stages of the retrofit uh, program and what you're seeing on screen here is just a, a quick extract from uh, from our uh, course so um, we've been doing this for nearly a decade now um, and these are this is a skill set that's now heavily in demand uh, as the uh, retrofit sector emerges um, I'll provide some context which has uh, not been covered so far really uh, this bit has around we, we know about the 2050 net zero target um, also, we have a, a much more short-term target of getting um, existing uh, housing down to band C, EPC band C by 2030. Um, I, I think that only applies in social housing, but I may be wrong. Um, um, there's, a, there's also the context of the existing industry um, and the problems that it uh, brings with it, really. Um, you see there a copy of something called the Each Home Counts Report, which was published in 2016 um, it took a long time to generate it was brought into uh, being because um, there were very high levels of substandard work being delivered some very high profile and catastrophic failures um, one of which of course we shouldn't forget was uh, later uh, than 2016 of course was the Grenfell fire tragedy which was a refurbishment pro project so um, you know it is a, it is not a sector that's really fit for purpose yet as Richard touched upon um, there's a, there has certainly been a lack of householder trust and also investor trust. Um, it's not been an investable proposition. And the government's response to that coming out of the Each Home Counts report was to um, sponsor Trustmark to become the quality mark for the sector. Uh, and that is a, a, a very important step um, because it's Trustmark's job to ensure that the higher quality projects that we all say are necessary uh, are delivered in practice. Uh, central to that has been the introduction of new British standards, um, crucially uh, the one you see here, BSI PAS 2035, um, which is becoming more and more widely adopted now, uh, particularly in the energy company obligation sector, uh, where it is becoming mandatory very soon and uh, across lots of other government sponsored programmes too. Um, it is a root and branch reform uh, of the industry and it's an enormous culture change. Um, and for the vast majority of delegates on this call today who aren't part of that existing energy efficiency sector, it also provides you with a very good model to build your business model around. Um, so I'd strongly suggest that people seek that out. Uh, and the other point I'd like to make in terms of context is the educational system that we have is not producing people who understand retrofit. That's the whole reason why my organization exists. Further education colleges, higher education institutes do not train people in retrofit. So it's no wonder we don't have the people to lead those projects. Um, we need to increase the size of the market in tune, in line with increasing the level of skills and capability in that market. Uh, and I've drawn a few specific examples there uh, around the, the social housing sector, the eco sector, all that's the fuel poverty market really at the moment. Um, and also the people who are really, really high skilled and really know how to do deep retrofit, but uh, do it on a one off basis and not at scale yet, which is something Energy Sprong actually are doing very well, are bringing a lot of that expertise into uh, the delivery side. Now, I mentioned that PAS 2035 gives us a framework to build around. Um, one of the crucial things that it introduces is a series of defined roles in a retrofit defined process. Um, you can see that on the right hand side. The one who looks a bit like Velma from Scooby-Doo is the retrofit coordinator, um, the people that we train, but there are um, several other roles there which are uh, fundamental. Um, very important that we uh, get the assessments that are carried out on property rights, uh, and they often haven't been in the past, so there's a, a big upskilling requirement around those assessors. Um, and crucially, there's a need to involve more and more high quality designers and architects. Um, the government's Green Deal, we may all remember, and there'll be a few sniggers around the country as I say that, um, ignored design and ignored architecture entirely, and it was one of its uh, key uh, flaws. 
the diagram on the left there, the triangle, shows the volume of people. Um, Richard used a slightly different number. Um, this number comes from the New Economics Foundation report published earlier this year. Um, this was just to get to 2030, uh, the, the EPC ban C target. And you can see there we're talking about a very, very big number. Um, the vast majority of whom, or almost half of whom, are, uh, of, are in the trades. So on my diagram on the right there, the retrofit installer people, the people who actually stick the insulation in the walls and the roofs and install the heat pumps and all the other measures that make up a, a, a whole house retrofit. And uh, on the trade side of things, you, again, from that new economics foundation report, you can see how big the gaps are uh, here, how many additional people are needed. Um, it's important to stress that 2050 isn't getting any further away. The number of properties which have done by 2050 is, uh, is not getting any smaller. So every year we leave this, the more people we need to carry out this work. Um, now, there is some, to some degree a need for reskilling within the industry. Um, but as many people on the call will know, there are massive existing skills gaps. Uh, and um, that, you know, that there is a stretched construction market in the UK anyway, in terms of labour. Um, so we really need to be focusing on bringing new recruits into the sector. Uh, and there is a significant image problem um, with construction generally, but particularly with retrofit, which has very much been a boom and bust uh, sector. Um, so recruiting all these tens of thousands of people quickly into the sector is going to be challenging. Um, what we need to do about that is ensure that there is a uh, positive career pathway available for people and that this becomes a defined uh, you know, sector that both trades and professions can see, a, see themselves building a career within. Um, so what we want to see is, is a lot of new qualifications, a lot of new courses which underpin those roles in line with clearly defined national occupational standards. Um, we're doing our bit there by having uh, an accredited um, level five qualification for retrofit coordinators, um, but there's actually a dearth um, of, of other appropriate courses around, and I've already mentioned the FE sector. So my final slide is really touching upon what we, what we think should be done about that um, and what we'll be focusing on. Um, the first thing we'll be doing is really upscaling our retrofit coordinator offer. Um, it's uh, we have over 600 people enrolled on that, which I a couple of years ago could barely have dreamt of. That's fantastic, but we need thousands of these people, um, and soon um, we've barely got enough retrofit coordinators to cope with the existing market at the minute, let alone that future market. Um, the second point to make is that the uh, it's not just about learning theory; it's about learning how to do this stuff in practice. It's about putting it in practice and giving people the tools to do to do their jobs properly. Um, and it's for that reason we've created a, a centre of excellence, uh, and we support organisations uh, who are trying to make the transition to whole house retrofit, and and we we fill gaps and address problems and barriers that they face. Um, we also need to work in partnership with people um, and uh, a recent government competition was launched that we put a, um, it's, a it's been a successful bid we understand um, we did that in partnership with combined and local authorities all around the country and um, we don't as a community interest company want to own this market we want to see the market created and we want to see it well serviced so we believe that these partnerships and that the colleges and universities who come through these partnerships are really key to helping upscale retrofit education um, central to that is addressing the, the elephant in the room, as I mentioned, around the uh, trade skills. Um, there, there are existing qualifications in insulation and building treatment, but they've, uh, they're badly out of date and they're very poorly subscribed to. Um, the, one of the BSI standards requires every installer in the sector to hold NVQs, um, and those NVQs aren't even available, so it's pretty impossible to ask people to hold them. So we're launching a project um, called Scaling Up Retrofit Education, or the SURE project, to ensure that that happens, and we'll be focusing on that over the next three months. Um, thank you very much for your time. I'm sure I've run over. Do apologise. It was all very interesting. So um, that is totally fine. We're okay with running over if it's all interesting content. Um, so <laughs> next, I'm um, going to hand over to Basil. Um, he's going to round out our um, presenter section, and then we're going to um, kick on with the Q&A. And we've already got so many great questions rolling in. Um, so please, everyone keep those coming, and we'll cover off as many 
as we possibly can. I am fairly confident as, at the rate at which they are coming that we might not get to them all, but we'll try and pass on um, any questions to the appropriate people afterwards if we need to. Over to you, Basil. Um, thanks. Thank you very much for uh, for having me and uh, and welcome everyone. and hopefully you can see my uh, see my screen. So uh, I'm going to give you a um, a quick uh, six seven minutes on uh, on an investor's perspective of the um, of the of the challenge that we're facing and the topic uh, today. So for those of you who don't know uh, who we are, for partnership, we're a real estate investment fund. Uh, we are um, were founded about eight years ago with a single purpose to really champion social and environmental uh, innovation in the built environment. We we look after about 600 uh, million or so of assets. So I'd say we're still on the on the small small medium size uh, end of the scale, um, but we're we're small and we, we like to uh, to to um, be nimble and, and agitate wherever we can. Uh, we're advocate and we advocate uh, cities. We love cities. We believe in cities, and we also believe in offices and uh, the living sector, particularly uh, innovative areas in the living sector where we've invested in co-living and uh, and senior living, and we've done that across the UK uh, and on the continent. Um, our vision is really a low carbon world where property is a force for social good. Uh, and over the uh, over the last few years, we've made a number of commitments. We've actually just recently become a certified B Corporation, um, putting us uh, notably amongst the likes of Ben and Jerry's, Patagonia and Body Shop, a uh, kind of an interesting collection of companies, three and a half thousand companies worldwide that have committed to putting profit and purpose um, uh, alongside people, at all three being of equal measure. Uh, we've also um, been able to achieve GRES uh, five-star ratings. Uh, we've committed to being net zero carbon by 2025, an industry-leading uh, pledge, and we're part of the Retro First campaign uh, as well. So a number of pledges that we've made as a company. So I think from an investor's perspective, there's just a couple of things to bear in mind. And I was interested that uh, now I think this some of these numbers have shown up a few times and I promise we didn't actually coordinate our, our comments, but but really, first of all, refurbishment is essential to achieving net zero. Hopefully that's not a contentious comment. Everyone here on the call would agree with that. And that 80% of the buildings that already exist by 2050, the UK's uh, net zero carbon deadline have already been built. So while we can all get uh, excited about new builds and shiny tall towers that are uh, in redevelopments on on brownfield or, or greenfield sites. Uh, actually, it's the 80% problem that we should be most excited about. The every building on every street. I think, sadly, um, again, when we when we scan the horizon, we see that something. It's a random number, but I'm sure it's it's got to be true that 90, 95% of the of the uh, buildings that can be retrofitted probably haven't been retrofit yet. And again, from an investor's perspective, what what's a, what are qualities of a good investment? Well, surely large untapped markets where there's little competition, where regula regulations pending that's going to force change, um, and there's underlying structural change. These are whether you're an investor in property or equities or private equity, no matter what, that, those have got to be qualities of a good investment. And then, from an investor's um, point of view, what are the challenges? And what, and what, frankly, uh, if there's a message to leave with you, is what, what could we ask of you and and the rest of the community? Uh, what help can you provide to help us help make the case to investors that actually um, uh, we can achieve profit from uh, from doing good? I think one one is a technical risk risks and uncertainty about retrofitting. So I think uh, there's a lot of um, investors who will think it's more complicated. You're dealing with an existing structure that um, that there are technical risks and cost and physical uncertainty in when you're leaving an old building standing. There's a perceived um, desirability of 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 new build versus old. People will talk about floor to ceiling heights and too many columns, or I just want to be in grade A. How could a retrofit be grade A? I think we've demonstrated in our own portfolio, and I'll come on to an example in a second, that that's that's not necessarily the case. And finally, there's um, it's kind of a, a, a mathematical problem, uh, oftentimes with the I call it a rental arbitrage between P, pre and post refurbishment. So if if you can only move rents on from say 20 pounds to 25 pounds a foot. 
pre versus post, you've got to somehow squeeze all the economic value of that CapEx into that five pounds of rental uplift. So you've got to do your retrofit and your improvements, and including sustainability improvements in a cost-effective way. Again, we think it's possible, um, but we need we need help as a, as investors um, from the community to, to show us the way. I'll finish quickly just with some pictures, um, two quick examples. This is an office that we did in, in Manchester um, called Windmill Green. Upper left-hand corner, um, the before, um, the bottom right-hand corner, the after. Um, hopefully we can agree that the after is better than the before, but we, we, uh, we added about 40% uh, net lettable area to the building by doing some infill, um, going up two floors. We kept a lot of the uh, internal char character exposing the waffle slab inside. You see the floor plates there, put a roof terrace on, open up a new atrium space, and deeply embedded an environmental sustainability into the mission of the building, um, uh, which uh, which has been uh, won a, a number of uh, awards, including the BCO Award for Most Innovative Building in the Northwest. And then finally, I'll just end on a residential building. We did, this one happens to be in, in Berlin, Germany. Uh, it's an old post office, probably one of the most challenging uh, projects I've worked on in, in my career. It was um, a historic landmark building, an old post office that we wanted to convert into 140 residential flats. Um, and we managed to take that ugly looking uh, loading bay in the upper left-hand corner and turn it into that um, lovely uh, interior courtyard with balconies and gardens. Uh, throughout, including um, on the bottom left-hand corner, we took the old postal hall and re-exposed the um, beautiful ceilings there and created some community space. So it is possible. Um, both of these projects, I'm happy to say, are, are making making money and um, uh, and not not without their challenges, though. And uh, but we're incredibly proud of them. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that, Basil. Um, it's great to hear from the the, the investor perspective on this one as well. Um, we have so many questions rolling in and you guys have all raised so many good points. I'm going to try and cover off as much as I can. Um, but first of all, I have a couple of questions myself, so I'm going to jump in there first. Um, the first thing I would uh, really like to get some views really from the whole panel on um, is that obviously today is quite an apt day for us to be starting Net Zero Live with um, you know, the 10 point plan being unveiled this morning. Um, and there already seems to be quite a lot of talk about whether, you know, an extra four billion pounds is really enough. And while one billion pounds um, to, you know, extend the Green Homes grant for an extra year will definitely be welcomed, uh, do you think there's scope for government to outline a broader, longer term strategy um, for retrofit of domestic buildings, given, you know, retrofit in the domestic sense is going to be quite a challenging, messy um, task that needs to be tackled <laughs> over more than the next 12 months? Anyone feeling brave and want to jump in first? I'll uh, start with that one then, if I may, because um, maybe I um, seeded it in my earlier comments, but a, a regular bugbear of mine is actually the current, current um, dysfunctional long-term plan for domestic uh, retrofit, which is to focus on uh, EPCC, which uh, at a number of levels is just wrong because it uh, doesn't adequately reflect the current performance of an asset. It's just a, a features-based assessment. Um, but it also drives people, it drives responses to achieve that target, which isn't necessarily contributing to achievements uh, of the net zero aim of longer term. <clears throat> so I would wholeheartedly welcome uh, an alternative longer term strategy, including funding. Uh, that focused with the end in mind on net zero, not a dysfunctional interim step, uh, which tempts people to spend £2,000 per property and just not get anywhere. It's going to get ripped out. The comfort's not going to be there. The savings, are, and most importantly, with three kids, the carbon savings not going to be there. And, and all of this is for nothing if unless it actually delivers real carbon savings, and that won't. So what I would say is, as well as that, I would say the £3.8 billion noted for the Social Housing Decarbonisation Fund should be directed at driving a self-funding guaranteed performance desirable pathway to net zero guaranteed and in that sense it has to be industrialized performance manufacture uh, and there is scope for the retrofit works and other things in there absolutely but we have to spend that money wisely not just to feed a parasitic job creating industry so yes please long-term plan but it's got to be effective 
So I'll, I'll get back in your box. Sorry. Can <laughs> <laughs> I, I comment? Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, I agree with 99% of what Richard just said, I think. Um, <laughs> we've, <laughs> we've known each other for a long time, and, and, and energy sprung is an absolutely vital part of, of this industrialised, you know, approach to, to and, and we should be getting as many homes and as many properties to, to net zero as quickly as we can. I totally agree with that. But there is another way. Um, but I mean, where Richard is absolutely right is to say, you know, you can get to EPCC by doing the wrong things effectively. Um, but you can also get to EPCC by doing the right things first. Um, and that's yeah. where the power standards come in uh, very, in, and have introduced a very logical approach that if you do a deep assessment on a property, you can develop a plan for that property to get it to net zero, but you can do that over 20, 30 years. Um, but you can totally screw that plan up if you do the wrong things first. Um, so doing things in the right order. It's another way of skinning the cat, but it's a very valid one. Um, but I totally support what Richard's saying about energy sprung as well. I might just add a, a sentence or two from um, uh, to, to both those those comments, of which I agree with. I think EPC is a, a very blunt a blunt tool, and I think we've all seen the charts that that energy efficient. Um, building can be have a low EPC rating and vice vice versa, but um, so I think it's not it's it's a it's not really the right the right um, lever. Um, I, I think that that subsidies are, are are great as kind of a prime a pump primer, but ultimately these things have to stand on their own two feet. And um, we've seen it, for example, solar is a great, a great example. So we had feed-in tariffs for a while and everyone said, oh God, the solar industry is dead. No one's going to put solar panels on the roof anymore once feed-in tariffs disappear. Lo and behold, we're, we're doing them everywhere. And we have payback periods now of five, six years without, without um, subsidies. And so I think whatever, I think it's the exit from those subsidies, which I find most interesting. It's like, so what? So you're going to spend a billion, two billion, five billion, whatever the number is. But whatever the whatever you do, it has to lead to, to innovation and, and cost, innovation and cost delivery as well, so that these things become economic imperatives in and of their own rights without the heavy hand of government. I think, Kieran, did you have anything you wanted to add on that one? Um, not specifically, because it, it, it's coming out from a different aspect of the market, to be honest with you, but during what, uh, what, what, what both David and Richard are saying on, on effectively what, what I see as the performance gap between as designed and as built is obviously a concern. Um, I think I think the, the big piece, you know, not necessarily fiscal or financial related, is is the consumer. Um, and, you know, we, 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 our members build for consumers and, you know, home occupiers. And, and I think there needs to be consideration to that as well as to how they're going to evolve in these environments as well. Um, and it, you know, th there's a consideration around fiscal stimulus, of course, um, but there needs to be more consideration around the actual home user as well. Okay. Um, well, Jordan, am I Jordan, just, oh, yeah. Go ahead. Just briefly to, uh, sorry, just a point to make because this is uh, non-domestic as well. A, a key facet is that whole EPC thing. The government has an opportunity to act now about setting minimum energy efficiency standards for rental properties uh, that are non-domestic. And currently the trend is appearing that they're going to repeat the failings of previous policy and set an EPC target for 2030. They have an absolutely great platform and opportunity to be inspirational and set the long-term journey for that market so that investors can make the right decisions to invest in net zero, not in an interim step for non-domestic properties as well. Sorry, just to add. No, that's great. Thank you so much. I might jump into some of the audience Q&As instead of just continuing to ask all my own, because that's a bit selfish. Um, <laughs> so um, we have one here that says, um, today in his 10-point plan, the Prime Minister has set out a target of installing 600,000 heat pumps every year by 2028. Um, while this is a great ambition, do the experts on the panel see this as a possible, as a possible thing in reality? Um, in regards to supply chain limitations, Brexit, skills, et cetera. I think maybe if I direct this one to David and Kieran in the first instance, and then obviously um, Rich and Basil, if you have any thoughts, jump in. Yeah, I, I, I'm very pro heat pump. Um, it should be part of most retrofits, most sensible retrofit strategies. Um, it should very rarely be the first thing that is done. Um, and there is a danger with setting that target that, that we're going to not address the fabric of these properties first and we're going to default straight to what we've done before with solar and, 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 and the like. And, and uh, 
uh, and, and, and growing that market and still losing a whole load of heat and, and carbon that we don't need to lose. Um, so that would be my concern. I don't know about supply chain capacity, particularly with heat pump installers, uh, other than to say, look through the yellow pages if it still exists and you won't find many listed. You will find a lot of gas engineers. So mm -hmm. I suspect that big challenges. Okay, I mean, I, I'll, I'll, I'll second uh, what David just, just said on, on his closing note there, but really from, from heat pumps generally, be it ground source, air source, etc. I think, you know, it's, it's, an, it's an ambitious target. Um, when we responded to the Partel consultation earlier this year, we took on board the, the views and you know, the, the input from the Heat Pump Association. And, you know, for us to achieve a... a uh, the, the rise in, in heat pump outputs, delivery and, and installation that they're talking about by 2028, it is an exponential rise required in, in a very, very, very short period of time. And, you know, the, the, the manufacturers are out there, they're talking to our members, you know, the, the major members, the PLC members are, they're already looking at this technology in a lot of detail and what solutions are out there that, that work in conjunction with both fabric efficiency as well as heat pumps as well. And as our industry normally does, it probably will find a way to, to achieve what it needs to. But let's not forget there is an overarching housing target. We have a housing shortage in this country. Um, you know, we need to be building 300,000 new homes a year. Now, that, that requires that if, if every new property is going to need a heat pump in whatever guise it is, that's going to need a hell of a lot of investment in, in the heat pump markets. And, and these markets are not mature. They're, they're, they're very, very premature in their existence. Uh, we saw heat pumps or heat, air source heat pumps being being installed in in properties back in sort of the, the COVID sustainable homes days. And, you know, in some instances it worked, in others it didn't. And a lot of that was around consumer understanding technology, the ability to install, commission, activate these things properly and then run them because they don't run like a boiler at all. And, and, and you know, the panel will be aware of this. I'm sure a number of the audience will be aware of this. It's a, it's a whole different all game when it comes to heat profiles, heat technology, it's not instant heat. It relies a lot on, on, on mass as well. But to close, I suppose, there are other concerns and, and other factors that bear into the supply chain and they are electrical capacity. I, I talked about this in my opening statement, you know, electrical capacity is a major factor here. You know, we are looking to, again, exponentially rise the amount of demand in electrical capacity for, for new dwellings, you know, uh, over the next few years be it for air source heat pumps, heat pumps generally, or, or other technologies such as vehicle charging points. And that will have knock-on effects to viability of scheme, that have knock-on effects to, you know, the overall coverage, the, the, the cost of off-site, on-site reinforcement as well, as well as, you know, is there sufficient capacity within our electrical grid in this, in this country? Question. Um, you know, the, the final piece is on skills and, you know, the number of heat pump installers, commissioners, calibrators that are out there, as, as David said, there's a hell of a lot of plumbers out there, a lot of gas engineers, and they're very specialist and a hell of a lot of M&E &E engineers as well. But heat pump manufacturers, heat pump installers, no, there isn't. And again, we, by talking and, and working with the Heat Pump Manufacturers Association, we need to, to seriously invest in this market and, and skill up our workforce. Hopefully that was um, comprehensive enough. No, no, very much so. Um, Richard... Basil, did either of you have any thoughts on yeah, that topic? I'll just, I'll just add quickly. I mean, I think that there are obviously lots of reasons not to do things. I think we, we, it's the time for time for baby steps is, is over, and uh, we need to really we need to figure out how how to to really turbocharge innovation. And if the government all of a sudden said no new home, homes can be connected to the gas grid, full stop, end of, I'm sure that that those yellow pages will will become quite full with people who are looking you know, have a heat pump and other installers and i and i just think if any we've learned anything from this covid crisis it's that it's that um there are lots of excuses not to do things but when when um when push comes to shove and when it's an it's an urgency as i feel like the climate emergency is an urgency now we've we'll find a way and i'm sure and we can innovate that's i agree my, uh, the, so the only thing i have is uh, you know, government is a role in signalling here, and they're um, th th what they're doing exactly that. They're expressing a uh, commitment and a direction of travel to long-term demand for heat pumps. It's for the market to respond as to how to address that, and uh, that's what we want. We want a long-term, large market opportunity to promote investment by the supply chain. I can't fault them, you know, in my view. They uh, 
some details need working out but that's that's our response to be done i suppose picking up that point in terms of <clears throat> government signaling their policy intentions um do you, does the panel feel that the government is now actually committed to moving in a certain direction or are we at risk of just seeing a repeat of previous policy that has um fallen a bit flat shall we say in practice um i think you probably have to cut policymakers a little slack uh, with COVID. Um, still, I'm not often uh, one for letting them off the hook, but um, you know the Green Home Grant is very <coughs> troubling um, and it's not, uh, it's not applying the standards that I've talked a lot about, I'm probably boring you about standards. Um, and that's a great shame, but I can understand why they made the decision because the supply chain that is delivering under those standards is, is immature and was very much into a transition. Um, so, you know, we've got to get the capacity and the capability into that supply chain as quickly as we possibly can. Um, and then government and investors uh, will have more confidence and they'll invest. Um, so it's a chicken and egg situation, really. The industry have really, and this is again something energy is probably doing particularly well. They've got to show the way. We've got to, we've got to innovate ourselves. We can't wait for it all to come from government. Agreed. I, I would say it's uh, have a, have a product. Uh, you know, it's not up to government to do all of this. The industry, construction industry, often blames clients for not asking for things in the right way. It's that's the other one. You know, and you kind of go actually have a really good product. And, and inspire the market to buy it because you know you didn't find steve jobs asking for you know, you know standards on uh, the charging uh, manufacturing point or uh, you know what he did was digital rights management as a commercial innovation servitization of intellectual property and some great product design now is the time for us to grasp metal and actually be the 21st century construction sector that we actually always wanted it to be my only challenge to, to the audience and ourselves is i'm not sure we can transition the existing construction sector I think we have to create a new one and what better place to start than actually refurbishment and retrofit. Mm. Brilliant. Did anybody else want to jump in on that one or do we feel that's covered that yeah, up I mean, pretty I, well? Yeah, I mean, I think we could violently, violently agree with that, Richard. I mean, I, I, I can't, it's changed a little bit, I'd say, in the last two years, but when certainly when we were first starting out, I can't tell you the number of meetings that we held with 20 people around the table where we were the ones as as the client and the, and the investor um trying to convince the, the the team and very clever engineers and suppliers and everything around the table to act to actually innovate and just saying like no no it's not good enough we want to have these things and i think there was a till recently probably a longer discussion around why that is but um you know i think till recently there was probably a fatigue with in clients demanding things and then everything getting value engineered out at the end that's changed i think there's there's a real demand now from investors and enough um kind of proof points in terms of higher rents and and lower yields for and the green premium for or or indeed brown discount for for assets that actually there's genuine uh interest on the part of the end end owners to 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 um to be part of the innovation chain okay um i might switch gears a little bit here um so if another question come in on the idea of refurbishment versus demolition and rebuild um do you panelists feel the embodied carbon advantage of retaining and refurbishing existing building fabric is adequately reflected in current procurement decisions well, I would say as an investor, I think pr probably not. Um, I think I think there's a bit of a bit of financial um, uh, kind of hocus pocus that goes on um, to make new build look like it's 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 better than um, uh, than uh, than refurbishment. Um, but but equally, I think there's a there's an emotional attachment to building something that's brand new, bright, shiny, tall um, as a as a kind of um, testimony to our own greatness. I mean, Windmill Green in Manchester is such a great example that, that had that sat for seven years empty. It had four different planning um, uh, planning applications from a 44-story tall, tall skyscraper um, down to a 17-story, you know, all all singing, all dancing, gilded gilded lily. And actually, none of them came forward. And the one that did come forward, the one that we did, was was the lo and behold, um, uh, kind of retaining the existing building fabric. It was more economic. We got 90% of the of the of the rents that we would have gotten from a grade A rebuild faster and with ultimately with less risk. So, um, 
it is possible. We just need a few more data points before we can get people off their um, off this notion that we can we we have to really build new. Does anyone have any other points to add to that? I think I think um, you had the right right person talking about it. I, th I think it's it's um, it's notably case by case. Uh, I I'm a big fan of refurbishment, but actually there are cases where refurbishment doesn't do enough, uh, and a new build creates more value. Uh, both uh, social and environmental as we can economic and so we have to re just recognize that these evaluations are the the triple bottom line most probably and that's the key thing to try and get into that decision and investment decision making okay um brilliant so we have another comment question come in which says very glad to see the panel has acknowledged designers as an essential component in the supply chain um previous rollouts of, imp of improvement grants have excluded design professionals um, which has resulted in disasters like cavity insulation um, causing serious damage and misery. How can we avoid repeating these mistakes going forward? I think I'm possibly well placed to answer that. So past 2035 will be applied across all sectors um, at some point in the near future. It's voluntary outside of government funded projects at the moment, uh, but it's it's clearly you know got momentum. Um, and it, it, it's got a simple, a very simple process uh, built into it, which fundamentally is all about being clear about what we're setting out to achieve, defining the outcomes, understanding the property and what should be done to it, developing a strategy approach to that property, uh, designing a solution that's going to work for that property off the back of that, and then delivering it and then monitoring and checking that it works. It's a very, very simple process to those of you in new build, you're thinking, this is change. Well, that really is change for the energy efficiency sector. That's very different from what they're used to, the way they're used to doing things. Um, but it's a sensible way of doing it. Um, so um, it is mandatory to involve a chartered architect or surveyor on many types of project uh, under that um, under that regime, and that's a very very important thing. <coughs> Sorry, I'm losing my voice here today. Um, brilliant. Okay. Um, so. <laughs> And on a similar, in a similar sort of vein, but a bit more broad, um, retrofit improvements in the past have been plagued by high costs and poor quality. This is from one of our um, audience members. How will this be managed in the future? Can I uh, take a point on that? <clears throat> you may. <laughs> I think, I, I think um, transitioning from uh, craftsman based environments and cottage industries to uh, you know this multiply bespoke refined non standardized to a more uh, kit of parts uh, you know more industrialized off site manufactured approach it is a way of actually assisting in those uh, uh, you know avoidance of quality issues and, and if um, I direct the questioner to look at platform based approaches that the cabinet office uh, are taking where you can, it's almost an IKEA kit apart solution that can be, or Delft or Mercedes, uh, where you can actually design a very 14 million different versions of something, but with a limited kit apart. For me, I'd be looking at industrialization, aggregation, and really sophisticated product design to create that kit apart at a scale which drives those economies and improvements in quality. Brilliant. Okay. Um, so I think. One thing I would love to do before we wrap up is sort of get everyone's views on, um, you know, how we can sort of achieve all this. It's something that Kieran touched on is that we really need everyone on board. Um, so I would love to just get sort of a quick summary from everybody on the panel about how we can get everyone in the sector on board um, in sort of achieving the net zero aims through re retrofit and refurbishment. Um, does anyone feel brave and want to go first? <laughs> I mean, I have a have a, have a quick go. I mean, I, I'm a I'm a big believer in um, in all electric buildings actually, and um, and I, but I think there's to to really decarbonize um, uh, the built environment. I think we have to make sure that we're not um, we're we're actually also decarbonizing the the grid and doing it correctly because I think it's we we procure 100% green energy and we're careful about where that green energy comes from and making sure that that's really that there's some additionality. We're trying to create additional uh, green capacity wherever possible. Um, so um, so I think that's that's a, a for me is a big a big focus to um, making sure that all of our new projects are are all electric 
and that we're we're helping in whatever small way we can to to um, uh, to decarbonize the the grid. Patrick, could, uh, you... oh, go ahead. <laughs> uh, if I could maybe do a counterpoint uh, just to uh, promote, uh, stir it up. You know, yes, what go ahead. Go ahead. you know what happens in the design you know we talk about the construction sector being full of dinosaurs we, we do i think don't we uh, it's not just me the uh well you know what happens to dinosaurs um i am not sure that actually the question is properly said i don't think we want everybody to take everybody with us i think we should be creating a new sector of all of the best bits of the current construct construction sector using off-site manufacturing, performance based, focused on quality, safety, and the environment, and the really insightful commercial models, promote that community and grow a new construction sector that delivers that. And so what I'd like to work on, and what, you know, with Energy Sprong and the Retrofit Accelerator for Homes, we're trying to create a movement of those people connected, operating together, working with clients that get it, designers that get it, suppliers that get it, and making that work and outcompete everything else so that that becomes the next industry. And actually, I'd quite like it if some dinosaurs went extinct. Mm. They become fossil fuels, though. We don't want that. Yeah. And leave them in the ground <laughs> and let an archaeologist hunt them. You know, that's it. The, uh... um, if I can sort of probe that point a little bit, how how do you do that? It, it's great to say you want to set up this new construction sector, but how do you actually do that? Well, you ask the contractors to go to the Innovation Partnership, apply for that. We've up to you know a, a, a procurement process there that's going to be collaboratively delivering products that are fit for purpose to achieve a scale market of up to 10 billion. You know the government's coming to market with multiple billions to uh, support and subsidise that. Why don't we just have a crack at that? So whoever wants to opt into that and is capable of doing it, I think you're going to find you're going to grow and you're going to outcompete. And you know to be honest, if people want to do the other version, that's fine. You know it is a diverse world and there's a whole world of opportunities. But this one on this topic needs to be the one I'm talking about. Brilliant. Uh, David, you look like you're ready to say well, something then. Again, I violently agree with most of what Richard's just said, but I, I mean, there, are, um, there are lots of properties in this country, millions in fact, where I don't feel that the prefabricated approach is going to be the right approach. So for the, it's not right for those buildings. So I don't think we can just do that. Um, but we do need to take a very radical approach in that sector too, in the more traditional, more conventional on-site, uh, you know, tra and, and there's no point as pretending that we have the skills in the volumes that we need to do that. We don't. So, uh, so I'd be encouraging people on the call to be talking to their local colleges, their local universities, whatever, wherever they employ people from, and, and asking the question of them: Why aren't you training people to do this? Kieran, what do you feel the next steps should be for the sector? I, I think, to be honest with you, I, I, I agree with most of the points you raised. I think that yeah. there needs to be a general cultural shift here, um, whether it be that in you know colleges and further and higher education, be that in actually taking the best parts of our industry forward, signing up to accredita accreditation schemes going forward. I think it, it's, it's a very difficult one to quantify, but I think you know we've talked about delivery vehicles, we've, we've talked about standards, we've talked about roadmaps, etc. And you know we're doing a lot with regulatory bodies, with governments, with you know stakeholders, you know the people who are actually you know have vested interest in these markets for be it retrofit or new build or, or, or refurbishment. Um, you know it does feel like a cultural change, and I'm, I'm going to refer back to a point made earlier about actually it's for industry to decide how this how this you know this period now 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 goes and, and how it sort of faces into these challenges and, and yes it is it absolutely is but but clarity over what we're supposed to be achieving in, in the initial point is is also very important um i think it's you know we've had periods of, of ambiguous regulation where it's it's not been 100 percent clear exactly what we're, we're trying to achieve here so i think you know we talk about getting on getting involved getting getting on board i think we need that from the other side of the table from the regulatory side as well and, and be it you know MXGLG from, from a building mix perspective or from off-gen in terms of capacity, from off what in terms of water consumption. We've, we've spoken a lot about heat, we've spoken a lot about um, electrical demand, but what we haven't spoken about is water and water demand. And actually at the moment, the, the work that off are doing and actually you know, bringing down water consumption per person per day um, and the challenges that lie within that as well. There's, there's a lot there and I think there's a lot of bodies that need to come on board on this journey. And I think they, there's a genuine ambition to do so 
be it by Sharon Stick approach or, or generally a cultural change in this country. But, you know, I think more cross-pollination, cross-party working, that sounds very high level and cliche, I realise that, but actually more of this workforce roadmap type approach, I think is, is the right way to, to deal with this. Okay, brilliant. Um, we're actually out of time already, which is flown by that hour. Um, we ha still have so many questions and I'm really sorry to anyone's questions who we haven't got to. Um, thank you to all our speakers um, for creating such a uh, topic that everyone wants to join in on. Um, we'll try and get across any questions that are particularly pertinent to anyone in particular. Um, just in case those are helpful. Um, I'd also just like to say a big thank you to Turner and Townsend who sponsored today's session. So that was um, really great. Um, and the final point from me um, is just that I would really encourage everyone to have a look at the rest of our Net Zero Live uh, content. We had a really great keynote speech this morning. I've got two more webinar sessions tomorrow um, and the Building Boardroom has published the first three parts of its nine part research paper into um, Net Zero. Um, so I would recommend that everyone takes a look at all that content. Um, and thank you again to our speakers and to our audience. Um, that's it from me. So goodbye. Thank you. Thanks.